In this video, we're going to capture the communication between a GAT server and its client using Teledyne LaCroix's Frontline X500, capturing the communication between two Bluetooth USB controllers. Now, if you're not familiar with GAT servers or you want a refresher, stick around after the demo and we'll go into more detail about that. But first, why are we interested in this collect? We could be interested in this collect for many reasons, including troubleshooting hardware and supporting the certification process. To simplify the collect, I'm using the controller, which will be the central and acting as a GAT client, along with the controller, which will be the peripheral and acting as a GAT server, both connected to USB to a single Linux virtual machine. Now on Linux, Bluetooth's host layer is called BlueZ, and I'll interact with that using a um, command line program called Bluetooth CTL, where I'll configure and control the GAT client and GAT server. To capture the traffic, we'll use the X500 as shown in the next slide, where it will capture both the USB and over the air traffic. To do this, going to have both the controller that's the central and the controller that's the peripherals USB connection running through the X500 while it samples the over the air traffic. Now the focus of the traffic will be on the ATT protocol which is how the GAT client and GAT server transmit and communicate data from the GAT server database. We're now ready for our collection setup. So we start with our USB controllers. We plug those into the extension cables. And then we take the other end of the extension cables and plug the type A connectors into the back of the X500 where it says USB host one and USB host two. We then take our mini connectors and plug those into the host one for the mini and then the host two for the mini. And finally, we're gonna take our USB-C connector and plug it into where it says host. We take the free ends of the connectors and then plug those into the computer. And finally, we'll take and connect power to the X500 turn it on, and when it boots up, we're ready to collect. So to perform the collect, I'm going to go to the wireless protocol suite folder that was installed and load up wireless protocol suite. Uh, you can also access it from the start menu in the Teledyne LaCroix folder. I'll select the X500 and it will then communicate with the X500. And once it's loaded, then I will go to the configure record, make sure that Bluetooth low energy is selected. I'm going to do automatic attenuation. For wired, going to select port one and port two, because we have both controllers set up. Select the pods, the sensitivity medium, and then pod two, and click OK. Also, make sure that the wired devices, both USB 1 and 2, are selected. Now, I've already chosen the addresses here, so you could add those addresses from add address, and then I've checked those. And I'm going to now select start record and start analyze. So the next step is to talk to the Bluetooth controllers via the Linux tool Bluetooth CTL. So we load those. I select the first controller. And if you look over here, you don't see any traffic yet because the Linux hasn't actually started talking with the controller. So I'm going to select which one is the server. And I've given it the name uh, GAT server. And then I'm going to go to the GAT menu. And I'm going to create a service. Is that in there? So just a service ID I had made up. 
So the primary service. And then I'm going to add a characteristic that's both readable and writable. And I'm going to give it a number, 53, so just as a default value. 53, just to show, is hex 35. So we'll see that later. And then the important part is to register the service, so or register the application when we're done configuring the GAT server. So it sets it up, but there's still no USB traffic, so it's still this program isn't talking to the controller. So then we go back, and I'm going to make the controller discoverable. Turn that on. And then I'm going to tell the controller, and see now we can see that the um, that it started talking to the program, started talking to the controller, and I'm going to now tell the controller to start advertising. So the next step, since we've set up the server, is to set up the client. And for the client, I'm going to now connect to the server over the air, and we can now see packets flowing across. And if we go here, we can see packets flowing here. And what I'm interested in are these ATT commands. And specifically what I'm interested in is seeing how everything is interacting with um, between the USB and over the air. So I went to, I'll show that again, quick filter, and I selected ATT, and then I'm going to um, select just to, I like this display, but we'll see the order of the packets when I select quick filter. It's going to interleave in time the over the air with the USB controllers. And to see this effect, if we go back to our um, client, which is now connected to the GAT server, what I can do is I can go to the client's GAT menu, and I'm going to have it list the attributes that it had already picked up, and so we can see our characteristic. Now, I'm going to select our characteristic and say read, or select attribute. So this is selecting the attribute of the server, and from the client, I'm going to read, and we'll want to look over here. And when I select read, we first see the uh, value of 35, which is hex 35, which is that 53 decimal that I put in. But we also see these read requests pop up. And if we look at the read requests, we can see if we go to uh, decode, we can see that this, um, the controller over USB is making a read request, and then it is transmitted, that read request is transmitted over the controller's address, and it's picked up by the, um, by the GAT server, and so it's and that's decoded and sent over USB to the program for the GAT server, and then the GAT server um, we'll then issue a response, and if we look in here, we can see that's where the hex 35 is, and then the GAT server sends, the GAT server's address here, it sends over the air that hex 35, and then we can see the read response of going to the client of reading the 35. Now, if we want to look at a write example, so I'm going to change this to write uh, decimal 23 and when we look at this we see that in this case the client now is going to be writing um, hex 17 which is decimal 23 and it gets transmitted over the client so the client then transmits to the server the server receives the command sends over usb to the server program which is the 17. And then we receive, um, it sends the write response back, 
over the air, over the uh, server's address, and it's received by the client. So this is some of the debugging features or analysis features real time. There's also a lot of great analysis that can be done after the collect is finished. Thanks for sticking around to talk about GAT servers. I've asked a lot of how questions about GAT servers and the ATT protocol. Like, how is data organized in the GAT server database? And how is that data actually communicated between a GAT client and the GAT server with the ATT protocol? And I would like to share what I've learned on my continuing journey to better understand Bluetooth. Bluetooth is about solving use cases. And a common one is being able to quantify and measure exercise while enjoying the exercise. So for example, one may want to measure the heart rate and your blood pressure while running and listening to music. And this is something that Bluetooth is ideally suited for because you can get low powered sensors for measuring heart rate and blood pressure and Bluetooth can control audio. If we add more detail to this use case, we could talk about how the heart rate is to be reported and what the units are or the blood pressure to be displayed or how the volume should be controlled and what are the levels of control. For the rest of this, these slides, we're gonna focus on this detail of heart rate, reporting it, and its units. We'll now take our use case and map it to a solution. And we'll start by looking at some of the details of the use case, specifically, the heart rate and how it's reported in the beats per minute. And we'll select the words of keywords of heart rate and beats per minute and their word phrase relationship of reporting. And we'll map it from the language that we use over to the language that Bluetooth uses, where roughly words map to attributes and word phrases map to characteristics. And then when we start talking about the behaviors and the relationships with data, that those paragraphs will map to services. And when we combine that with the roles of devices and their functionality with services, that overarching story will then map to a profile. And this is then organized into what's known as the GAT server database, where at its atomic level, we have words and attributes and characteristics are made up of those attributes and services are made up of characteristics and a profile is a combination of services along with roles. Now we'll start with the most basic level of words and we'll choose heart rate and what we'll do is we'll discuss the heart rate, um, translating the heart rate over to an attribute. The two key components for an attribute are its value, which is normally a number, and a label associated with that value to provide context. So for example, if you go to purchase gasoline, you don't purchase just five, you, you, it's, there's context associated with it. So five liters or gallons of unleaded octane 87, for example. And the type or the label provides a number that will then reference units, uh, what this value is. So for example, Bluetooth has defined a specific label or type for heart rate measurement. And they've also defined what the value um, range is. And so in Bluetooth, the range of the heart rate measurement is between zero and 255 beats per minute. To provide context, an average 30 year old has a resting heart rate of between 60 and 80 beats per minute with during extreme exercise could maybe get close to 200 beats per minute. 
So th this provides a wide enough dynamic range for most use cases. The step size is one beat per minute. And what that means is that you could have 10 beats per minute for a value or 11 or 12, but not 10.5. And with one beat per minute, this gives 256 unique values. And that number is important because 256 unique values can be stored in one octet, which is eight bits, commonly referred to as a byte. And this value to associate this number with a heart rate measurement, uh, Bluetooth chose a unique labeling scheme, which is common in the IT industry called universally unique identifiers or UUID. And this is a 128 bit number. What's nice about it is they're easy to generate from either websites or most operating systems have programs natively to generate those. And this number, which is shown here in hex format, um, is if you see this specific number in blue, so these the sequence of digits in blue is special because that means that whatever number is here in yellow, that that is a a specific Bluetooth registered ID label or type that corresponds to um, something that has been defined by the Bluetooth standard. And also you'll often see in the case where it has been um, defined that the shortcut will just be these four digits. So while this is the core information and attribute, there's, there are some important details. And so if we take our heartbeat measurement, and which is the uh, one octet in value, and we look in general for an attribute, there's actually uh, a couple more pieces of information that are associated with an attribute. The first is something called a handle, which is two octets or 16 bits. In a value, where in this case we had one octet, you can actually have up to 512 octets, and it could be any type of data. Um, a lot of times they're numbers, but, but it could be uh, string information that's represented by the binary data. There's also uh, permissions that are associated with just the value, and we'll talk a little bit more about those, and that's implementation specific, which is why there's a dotted line. So with the attribute, we have our type, which is either 16 octets, if you're just making one up. So right here, we're just making one up. Or it could be two octets if you're using a registered Bluetooth UUID, which is shown right here. The handle is, it's kind of like in radio communications where people have nicknames that they refer to each other on the radio as a shortened form. That, that's basically what this handle is. It's, and it's uh, two octets or 16 bits. And it provides a method for in the GAT server database to organize this information. So let's say you have two heartbeat measurements which have the same type that you, they would each have different um, handles. And that's also a shortcut too, because it's uh, 16 bits. And so it, they're in that sequential order. And this also simplifies the ability to search and find information in the GAT server database. So the handle can also be thought of as uh, like a database index. And it's unchanged during a connection. So you can trust that the the handle remains constant, uh, the values remain constant during a connection. Now permissions are interesting because the permissions, again, only they, they only apply to the value. So any device can read a handle and type of any attribute in the GAT database, but it may or may not be able to read the value. And that depends on the implementation uh, the value permissions, which are implemented normally at a higher layer than the lowest layer of the attributes. And the, the permissions cover things such as, is this value readable, writable, or readable, writable? Is this value encrypted for privacy, security? Is authentication required? So, 
So um, have you, do you have to verify who someone is before, or a device is before accessing the value? And then authorization is, do, like once they've been authenticated, do they actually have authorization to access that value? So all of this is covered um, by these value permissions. Now let's look at the actual heart rate measurement. What I showed so far has been one octet in the value field of the defined heart rate measurement. There's actually more information defined in the value fields. I'm not going to go into detail as to what all these are, but it's interesting to get a sense of appreciation of how the value fields can combine multiple types of data. So there's information about the actual heart rate signal that can be stored in there, and actually the heart rate measurement where it can go from zero to 255 beats per minute, or depending on this flags field, which uh, if we zoom in on that, it can either be the one octet or for more dynamic range could be two octets. So these value fields can be rather complex for just one attribute. But how when you need to combine attributes, how are those combined? A characteristic is composed of multiple attributes and links together information about how the client can communicate with the attribute along with additional metadata about that attribute. A characteristic has a standard format. It's composed of a minimum of two attributes, one called the declaration and the other the value. The value would be the attribute that we have looked at previously, such as the heartbeat measurement attribute. The declaration provides information about that attribute in a standard way. The declaration has its own handle or shortcut name in the, in the database. It also has its own UUID. So this four digit UUID, when you see this, you know that this attribute is a declaration attribute for a characteristic. The attribute's value is composed of three parts. The properties, which concern properties of reading and writing the value attribute. And also it stores a copy of the value attribute's handle along with the value attribute's UUID. This is important because the permissions on the declaration attribute is that it's read-only and it doesn't require any authentication or authorization. So any device can read all the characteristic attributes declarations in the GAT server database. So this way, there's a generic way for any device to determine what value types um, are available to be read on a particular device. A characteristic Besides including the declaration and that value attribute, it may include something called descriptors. And there's quite a few different types of descriptors. It could be metadata about the value. There's one that's common, and it also has its own UUID number. And this one, the client characteristic configuration, has information about communication of the server with the client. Ordinarily, the client initiates communication where it will ask the server for data or write data to the server. But this allows the notification indication allow the server to tell the client when there's new data or data that's changed. If we look at a little more detail on the declaration attribute value, we'll see that in the attribute value, the characteristic properties, which is one byte or eight bits, that this is information concerned with communication with the client. So depending on what bits are set, it talks about whether this information can be broadcast and how the client and server can interact with read and writes, whether there's notifications or responses required. So that, that would be more reliable type of communication. 
and also information about authenticated signed rights, and there's even additional information for extended properties. We see that the value attribute handle, which is the the handle of the um, like the heartbeat measurement, would be the standard two octets, and the UUID that's stored depends on the value attributes UUID, and if it's a registered um, UUID, it'll be two octets, and if it's one that we made up, it would be the full 128 bits or 16 octets. So we've looked at here, we've talked about data and the attributes and characteristics, but not how behaviors are tied to them, which is done at the service layer. Services combine one or more characteristics, along with possibly other services, to implement a feature. And continuing with our heart rate example, just like we have the heart rate measurement as a standard, that the heart rate service is also a standard with its own UUID of 180D. The service is composed of data of characteristics that include the heart rate measurement that we've looked at and the descriptor which allows notification along with two other pieces of data. One is the location of the heart rate sensor and something called the heart rate control point. And this is a way for the client to communicate with the um, heart rate sensor to be able to tell it when the somebody wants to start measuring how much energy they're expending during exercise. And that's because heart rate is a good indirect estimate of energy expenditure during constant uh, exercise. So those are the data pieces that are available in the heart rate service and a service also combines behavior with that data. And two the behaviors of the service I want to highlight is one is that the service can notify the client when data a heart rate measurement is available and also the service will if the client is ready to begin exercise that it can write a zero one and it will then the behavior will be to reset the accumulation of that energy expenditure now this is a specific service that may or may not be on a device there are two services that are mandatory and the first one's called the generic access profile service gap service which has its own uuid and this combines, this has all the characteristics or data for gap roles that devices have to be able to support of the broadcaster that could be observer or peripheral or central. And additionally, it has the characteristic data of the device's name and appearance. There must be one of these running, these gap services running on a device. Now there's also something called the generic attribute profile service which has the UUID of 1801 and if the device supports robust caching or what's called enhanced ATT which is a communication protocol of the uh, attributes between devices if it has those or if it allows services to be added, removed, or modified, then it needs, it's mandatory that it has this service running. And just like the GAP service, there can only be one of those services running on the device. So we've talked about services and how those implement a feature, but how are features used to implement the use case that we want to solve? So just as services combine one or more characteristics along with possibly other services and behaviors to implement features, that profiles will combine one or more services along with possibly working with other profiles to implement a story or a use case where different devices have different roles. So if we go to our heart rate, um, not only is there a 
heart rate service and heart rate measurement attributes, but there's also a heart rate profile. And this profile has two roles. One is a collector role and the other is a heart rate sensor role. So the collector role's purpose for that device is to receive measurement and other data from a heart rate sensor. So this collector is normally something like a cell phone. The heart rate sensor role is purpose is to measure heart rate and other information. So that would be that low powered heart rate device that, that's actually measuring the heart rate that's talking to the collector. This role, this profile, works with other profiles, such as the generic access profile. And there, it's working with it because the collector will assume the central role. So the collector is the one that sets up the connection with the heart rate sensor, which is assuming the generic access profile peripheral role. It also works with the generic access uh, attribute profile, the GAT uh, profile, where the collector is the GAT client and the heart rate sensor is the GAT server. So we've talked about the different profiles that that these that the collector can implement, not only the heart rate profile but additional profiles. But how is the data actually communicated between the two devices implementing the two roles. It's communicated using something called the attribute protocol or ATT. The key point here is attribute. The only things sent between the two devices are attributes. Information such as services and profile information is not sent or characteristics, just attributes. A device that, that is considered a GAT client has the ability to read data from the server, write data to the server, or search the server. While the server really only has the ability to notify the client using this attribute protocol. How does it do that? How, how do either of these devices communicate with uh, reading, writing, searching, or notification. They can do it in four different ways. One is by sending a command. So the, the um, client could send a command to write to the server. And a command, which is abbreviated CMD, doesn't get a response back. So it's, it's uh, a little more risky that information could be lost. If it's important that that you know that that information was written, instead of sending a command, you could send a request. And then when the, when the processing happens, when the data is written, you'll receive a response back from the server. This is also good for, uh, for when you would issue a read request, then the response would include the read data. If you're having the server notify you when information occurs, where you being the GAT client, could either use a notification, where the server simply sends information to the GAT client and doesn't expect a response back. So that's easier to do and could be quicker, but it could also be uncertain whether the client received it. If it's important to know that the client received the information, the server can send a indication and then the client needs to reply back with a confirmation that it's received it. One issue is the, the trade-off of speed and reliability that with commands and notifications, multiple commands and notifications can be sent without having to wait to receive, well, there is no reply, but in the case of requests and indications, they are limited by the um, speed at which they can receive the responses and confirmations. Now, what, what are some of the commands that are using, or the, that use the commands and requests and notifications with these abbreviations. The common traffic that uses that is 
traffic that is finding data and it could be looking for handles those were those nicknames those database handles that are at the beginning of the attributes and so it could be looking for specific handles to then query for uh, reading them or writing data to it the read if it's if you're making a read request you would see traffic set with ending with the req and then the information that you're getting back from the server would that command would have the rsp if you're writing data to the server and you it was important for it to be reliable you could send a write request where you include the attribute handle, that database handle, and then the value that should be written there, and then you'll get a response back from the server. When you go to uh, write a command, in contrast, you include the handle and value, but you don't get any type of response back. And when we look at what the server can send, that the server could send the um, notification where it sends to the client the handle and then the value that that uh, changed and also if it, if a uh, it's important to get back a confirmation it could send the handle and then value and then wait for the client to send a reply so this is the common att traffic and if we look at the information that is actually sent, if we look at a GAT server database to see how that is organized with these handles and values, we can see the structure on the last slide. So we've seen that profiles implement use cases which define the roles of devices, and those devices communicate with attributes. And that if we look at a GAT server database, that it's made up of services, which can include other services, includes characteristics, which those include attributes. And we'll end with looking at a simple GAT server database, which is right here. So the GAT server database has those that index, the handles that are increasing numbers. And if we look at the first entry, it defines the UID, defines a primary service, and that particular service is the mandatory GAP service, which is 1800. And when we look right here, this next entry, which is part of that service, since it's right below the primary service, this defines the characteristic declaration. And the value there is the property Z02, which means that it's only readable. And then the handle and the UUID of the characteristic value, which the handle is right here and the UUID there. And that UUID is for device name. And its value is binary values, which, which are for the letters heart monitor. And when we look at the next characteristic declaration, or the next entry, which is also the start of another characteristic, and the declaration here points to appearance. Now, because we haven't seen another service entry, that, that means this is part of this primary service, of the GAP service. So this defines the handle 05 and its value to a, or UUID 2A01. And so the value of this characteristic is right here, and that's the appearance. And for this um, UUID for appearance, the value 00 means an unknown appearance. We get to the next entry in the database, and that is for primary service. So anything below this until the next primary service entry is for the values in this primary service. And this primary service is the heart rate service. And if we look at the next entry, it starts the definition of a characteristic, and that is also read-only. And the value of the characteristic has a handle of eight and then a UUID of two A's three seven, which is the heart rate measurement characteristic that we had looked at earlier. And that would have two bytes of the flags and then the actual heart rate measurement.
And we also include the descriptor, the CCD, which is mandatory for the service. And the value of one corresponds to meaning that it would send out notifications. So this would be a very simple database that one would uh, see in a device.